What's our point out? You're here making communication to social engineering management, uh, just learning. Uh, and so I thought we'd just go ahead and just jump on in. Uh, my goal of this presentation is to give you guys things to think about. I'm not going to solve your problems, I'm going to hold it in, how you start thinking, in a different place, uh, and then possible next steps, what you can do to um, you know, either make the switch or prepare to make the switch or decide whether or not you're going to make the switch. Um, but yeah. Also, warning, your mind was very dirty. Uh, this is just based on my personal experience. I'm not like the main person. It's just that I've experienced the last. You know, 10 years of being involved, especially about over the last six. Um, also, I'm hoping to be more conversational as a presentation. So, feel free to interrupt with questions. If I ask questions, please answer. If I have no problem, there's awkward silence. I really like it. So, um, who am I? I'm Mr. Carney. I'm the Senior Director of Engineering and Desert Digital Media. You don't know what that is. Uh, we do KSL.com, so, the primary thing must be Carney.com. They help out there in the um, I'm here for over 40 teams, or an analytics team, or advertising platforms team, our KSL news portion team, and then our coaching technologies, like our CMS team. Um, also, remember the developer source community. I've uh, been great at making those nice stuff for the last few years. Um, and uh, real quick, just a quick poll. Who here, here says I'm an engineer? Okay. How many like team leads do we have here? Uh, it's just like a manager, you're a full-on manager. Two in the sit in the back. Um, do you have any managers or managers? Okay. Cool. All right, we have a good mix. Um, so I want to start with a story. And uh, it was a feel, unfortunately, I have time to find cool pictures of a lot of the stories because I've always been talking. Um, I was a PDM, and I've been there about two years. Um, I started out with me and two other engineers on this small, tiny business platform. We've grown an additional two other engineers, um, and we were super busy. We had a huge backlog, trying to do all sorts of cool things. And then um, I sat down in a meeting with um, our senior leadership and our sales team. Now, I'm normally not in that type of meeting at this point in my career. And as they're talking about the challenges, they reviewed some data that I put, pulled together to present to them. And listening to all the conversations they were having, I had like three opinions. I was like, wow, we can do X, Y, and Z to solve this problem, or we can do this to solve this problem. And, and I, I, I left that meeting, I'm like, awesome. I know, like, you know, these three different things, and I put them kick butt. And then as I'm leaving the office, I look at my calendars, and the first meeting of the day, I looked at it, it was really full. And I was like, have any time for any of this. That's, I don't I don't have, you know, like the time more is down is like just cranking my cut off. Even if I was, I did, to do all three of the projects and do them justice, you know, it would take a really long time. And that was the moment where I had, I realized I said, you know what? I can't just do it all myself. I, I really need to focus and and not just be a manager who brings high cars, be a manager who, you know, Host meetings, team manager who you know, just does whatever managers do. I need to be someone who's like, who's like really trying to empower the those teams so we can do all the things that we do to be successful. Because um, I don't know if you guys paid attention to how the media industry is right now, it's pretty hard for um, us. And it's really important for us to be able to maximize what we can do and be able to share contributions to the company. Um, and so, you know, what I thought when we first started this off is like, what is, what is a manager? Who's a manager? What defines someone who's a manager? Um, any thoughts? How you all would define who's a manager? The primary responsibilities involve people. Okay, good. Keep the people busy. Mentorship. Okay, good. Does the next slide ask what is a leader? <laughs> um, you know what? That is a great question. It is not. But you know, I'm guessing as soon as a manager, you also expect to be leaders. Well, you you would hope so, because I've I've worked for managers and I've worked for leaders. Mm -hmm. a, a manager approves time cards, and a manager makes sure that they know what you're working on, mm -hmm. and uh, those kinds of things. Uh, you can also have a leader who mentors, uh, who 
helps helps you grow personally and grow professionally uh, as a member of the team. Uh, and so I, I would say that there's a difference between a manager and a leader. Not all leaders are managers, and uh, many managers are not leaders. Yeah, and I, you know, I would argue with your premise. I would argue that a good manager should be all that. Yes. Not everyone's not, not a good manager. Uh, and I would argue you can probably have scenarios where uh, people just get thrown in, like someone's at least, H leaves the company, and we're like, oh, well, let's just go have a senior developer. And, hey, you're not a manager. Good luck. You know, you know, uh, our industry is a bad track record preparing people for managing people. Yes, uh, um, I would say a manager is more concerned with the out with the output of their team and how they um, and how the team looks than they are with their own individual output and how they look. Okay. Well, we often go home. You guys have covered most of the topics. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you're right. There are two primary types of people. And I think it's something different. And their success is measured by their results of their individual contribution. Their primary goal is so technical, and it's about code, it's about uptime, it's about all that stuff. Um, and that's an individual contributor. Um, then you have what we call a manager, and their success is measured by the results of their team, of, of the people that they manage to collect as a whole. Um, and their primary goal is for the people and the outcomes of that team. Not necessarily the individual details of the code, uh, and so uh, so what this whole situation is isn't going to be covering different aspects of making that mental shift, kind of moving the thing about how you help them manage the people, uh, and are also in the computer order because it's just like jotting down lots of space too quick. Um, so the first aspect is the mental shift. Um, and when I was talking to people back at Cox, a recent guy of ours who promoted to be a manager over a team, and said, Hey, congratulations, you're going from being a senior engineer to junior manager. Uh, and the reality is, is when you set the judgment at the goal, a lot of this, the engineering skills that you bring to you are super important. But they're not going to be supposed to be using day in and day out. And there's this whole new skill set that you have to go in and say, Hey, I'm not, I'm not super used to flexing these management muscles. And you know, just like debugging code and like find my system calls, you know, and show into the servers and that poor shit is like a can't really show into the person and be like, okay, just reboot their emotions and video. <laughs> uh, and so uh, and so there's a whole new skill set we kind of have to have to uh, make. And if you're making mistakes, like I always tell people, look, you're kind of stuck being a manager the first time. There's no great, great, great training or you know, or Sarah, of course, you can go and do it. Certification program, bad, you're going to be awesome. And that's okay. And the importance is that we'll continue to make the managers at PDM and hopefully other places to put that support structure around them and say, hey, we're going to help teach you this. Hopefully, they had some prepared preparation beforehand to kind of set up this new goal. Um, and the primary thing is, as you guys said before, you have to think about people first and not about the code. And this is really hard when you spend like the last decade thinking about the code. You love code. Technically, it does what you tell them to do. Sometimes your instructions are poor, you know, and you introduce bugs, but technically, it does exactly what you tell them to do. And it's designed to constantly like, to tell them to do. And that whole, that whole paradigm. So, you know, as an engineer, a lot of times, just there's nothing magical about code. Um, and so I'm going to give an example. Let's say you're on a team and you're having problems where the site keeps coming down or space is being stable, you know, persistent problems for some weeks, and you're saying, oh, we're having stability problems. And so you have those, you know, those two paths that you can go down. The individual contributors need to and should go down the path of thinking like, okay, we have, a, we have problems with code stability, are we like pushing up buttons or are the servers always loaded during key times and cause cascading failures? Or once again, they're thinking about technical uh, problems. And as a manager, you're more than welcome to participate in the conversation. I still participate in those conversations all the time. But the subtext of my, the mental dialogue I'm having is saying you're thinking about, okay, do I have the right people on this team? Do you have the right skill set to solve this problem? Are there things that we need to learn or maybe, you know, maybe 
address their mental models. Or you maybe teach them a couple lessons, or just just things that require you to choose for the problem. And thinking of this is saying, not only you know, I could go ahead and just fix the problem, their managers do this. It's going off. Well, so and so and so imagine just fix the problem. Go, oh, I'm not Gary, fix it again. You know, or hey, I'll fix it here. I want to use Gary because I think Gary from my team is awesome. I want to keep that name. I said, I'm going to work with Bob. So Bob did it again. You know, he's like, imagine fix it and on the fly. You know, I'm on our day and then maybe some later. Um, and so managers go into that dark kind of path where, you know, as engineers normally go traverse and say, oh, how do I solve this team problem? Uh, and then I also tell my new engine managers, the number one thing you could do wrong is to have this model say, well, I'm coding well, I'm doing a good job. The rest of my team is being slackers. Your whole team is not doing well. This is your goal. I don't care how awesome the code that's exuding from your fingertips. I don't care how awesome the PRs are coming in. I don't care how awesome all the magic unicorns that are uniting to push the production. If the rest of the team are standing behind you, you have literally failed. Yeah, because that's not your job to be the one national leader and watching your team. Like, Why do you guys do what I mean? That's not how they manage your plan. Um, and so, this is a, once again, it's a hard myself to shift to, to walk into, but it's super, super critical that you have a mindset that says, I am the team you're playing. I need to think differently. I need to do things differently. That's okay. I will miss the code, even I can still kind of see it once in a while. But that's not my primary job anymore. Um, the last thing that I found was the hardest for me, and I had to accept this reality to be able to move on, was that I was responsible for 100% of the code. If the site went down, I had a phone call. This, you know, if, if, there, if we need customers' information, I was in the hot seat. You know, and, and I was responsible for like 100% of it. And then I had a point where I was literally writing less than 5% of the code. And that was really hard for me to, to, to go on and really accept. And that's why it was so important to say, okay, what makes me an awesome engineer? Well, I'm awesome, but that's the lie I tell myself. What makes me a super awesome engineer? And how do I transfer those traits to my team and help teach them those things? And then let them take them and then add their own awesomeness to it and be even better than I am. And, and not only do I do that with one person, I can do that with four or five or eight people. Next to my whole life, eight half dressed in the phone books, you're way awesome than I am, going off and kicking butt. So that's kind of the, the, the mentorship that you have to go through. And it's very difficult, it takes time, um, but it's totally worth it. The second thing we were brought up is mentoring. Um, I also call this kind of thinking, you know, about growth in your team. And so, this one's good. You cannot scale, your only option. To help teach and train your people um, to be better at what they're doing. Um, so, what I do is I take time on a regular basis and I think about someone's, uh, someone's growth. Now, I'll talk about logistics, that's kind of like a normal one on one that weekly. But on, on every four to six weeks, I literally sit down and say, like, hey, how is Joel doing? How is he growing? How is Rodrigo growing? How is Jared? How is Matt? Um, and I think about the progress. Then, what I call car metric style, I don't know what else to call it, but what I do is for me, if I'll have a kickoff one on one, say, hey, if I get a new mentee, we'll have a kickoff meeting and we'll discuss goals or career aspirations, what we're good at, what we're weak at, um, kind of just get a put together a little game kind of topics we like to discuss. And then every four to six weeks, we meet for one hour and we don't talk about like, how we solve the problems in production, how we solve. This, you know, BQ keeps coming down and bugging us. It's, it's totally geared around, okay, how do we help you grow as an engineer? How do we help you grow? And then if we have someone who's becoming a whole bit of a new leader and be a manager themselves, how do we help gain some of those skills and processes? We'll discuss a topic, and sometimes we'll just quickly discuss two or three. It's very loose, very informal. Um, it has to be very safe. We'll share that. Mentoring sessions, I don't share outside anywhere else. Uh, and I was going to make a joke about one time when someone told me in those sessions, like, don't make sure that. Uh, I'll ask permission for people to be there. Um, at the end, we'll create items or like action items or happy events, but like things to try and do outside of over the next four to six weeks. And then 
I'll skip to the next one. You want to follow up? At least rinse and repeat. And we'll do this for indefinitely longer. So hopefully, I will work on her reports. Um, so, you can think that I'm doing this. His name, Spencer Dixon, uh, each knows who he is. Do you want know, you know Spencer? I used to manage Spencer. Huh? I used to manage Spencer. Okay, he used to manage Spencer. This is the case. So, I have a story about Spencer Dixon. So, Spencer was an amazing engineer. He loved engineering. He liked code. He was a workhorse. He just got stuff done. And then about a year ago, we were sitting down and I said, you know what? Well, we don't have an opening yet. But our spidey senses, just because the way our is, know that at some point we are going to need to have a manager. And so I went and I talked to Spencer and I said, hey, all these mentoring sessions with you, what was the goal of making a pretty good manager one day? And he was not super thrilled. You know, he's like, I like code, I like kind of coming in and doing my thing. And and just just you know he's like I understand why isn't the management supporting I don't think I'd be very good at it. And so we had mentoring sessions. We talked about it. Like, what do you like this? Oh, because you know, you know all this really poor experience of being old school kind of stuff was really was really hurting his vibe. I'm like, okay, so you should find the people when you're when you're boss for the most part. And um, but we started having these mentoring sessions one on one every four to six weeks. We have we have we have for a year. And literally, almost on the day of when, uh, of when we started those, um, he made a ton of progress. And he, uh, we had someone leading our company, it was a great opportunity, and we had our most profit bearing product as his lead the manager. We did, we did not have some of our team ready to step up and grow into that yet. Um, and, and we're like, crap, what to do? And we were interviewing, we're like, crap, we can't find anything good. This is like response for so much revenue. So much revenue. And we said, well, get Spencer. And we went and talked to Spencer, and there were some changes happening on the team that are right now. Hey, Spencer, I know maybe this wasn't your thing about this yet, but we need you to step up. You come back here. We come over, take over this team. You should talk for so much revenue. And there's some interesting dynamics going on right now on the team. And so he said, okay. And so he went in and he started selling to the number for a month, month and a half, and his team loves him. His mentor, his director, who he reports to, loves him. His scrum master loves him. And I'm just like, oh, yes! You know, that's awesome that he was able to make that jump. And that's where that, that mentor came in. We really said, hey, what do we do to help you grow? We're all going crazy. We, we need to be able to expand. And we're able to have fun. So he will die if you know the following story. Because he is, in fact, I actually put another slide that's showing that the whole time. I forgot I did that. Um, but anyway, so yeah, so that's some of the benefits that you can get out of mentoring. Um, and it's totally worthwhile. Um, the next one is what I call our one on ones, or AKA logistics. And so on my one on ones, um, I have these every week with my employees. Then occasionally, I'm out of town, I'm out of town, this one, it's not a big deal. Um, but I won't go two weeks without having one. And there's two things I cover. I cover what I call logistics. This is kind of like, hey, we're at this project. We have access to the service cloud. We have those kinds of um, you know, ask my tenants. Um, and it's not a full set report, it's kind of just checking in. And then I also talk about we're out. Hey, how are you doing? How are the people on the team doing? You know, and, and typically these last 15 to 20 minutes. You know, they can go longer, they can go longer. But these are super crucial to have. And what I found is, is that if I, if I, if I'm not diligent about having them, I can have an issue so it's boil up. And it wouldn't came out one on one, but it doesn't because I wasn't having it because I was not a good manager. And then it starts to mess for a couple of weeks, and then it kind of blows up in a way that I was like, ah, this is so much more painful to handle now than it was before. And so this is where um, they're really important. Uh, you're going to want to adapt to one of those styles and each of your direct reports. Um, they're all very good people. And so you're going to find out what your style is, what kind of important to you, and how you adapt to the people. I have one guy who literally sits down and I say, well, hey, how's it going? How's the project good? Do you have anything else? And I'll literally say, no. I mean, I guess I just did a, you know, I'll tell me something. Like, oh, you anything else? No, I don't. Well, I, you know, I'll tell me something else. <laughs> I just used to, like, okay, I'm not asking two or three times if you guys have anything. That's how I get out of it. Um, but that's just how he is. I have no 
level of learning for it, it was hard to make those all feel like my man. He was so direct, he was so just chill, and he didn't talk at me. I'm like, you doing good? Yep. Want to play on the team? Yep. Get in the project? Yep. What was my feeling like? Good project. <laughs> I'm like, but that's the way it works. We got the information across, and we were doing good. I had other friends who were on the who I already planned.
imagine is my expectation is. And if the phrase my expectation is blank has not left these lists, I can't be mad about it. Now, I haven't clearly communicated that expectation. Now, if I go in and I say my expectation is blank, and we have a conversation, and then I have enough deep expectation to me, and make sure we both agree to it, it's a fair expectation. Sometimes I'll say that, and they'll be like, that's not very fair. Something I had to consider. Like, right. I'll just my expectation is really the month we both on the same page. And then if they follow up, ask awesome, great. I'll give them praise and our meetings and you know, well, that's the fun that's in the same meeting, so kind of be weird to give praise for that. But you know, when it was appropriate, you know, praise for others, or whatever, say, hey, awesome, good job. But if they did it, the instinct is to wait until maybe you're gonna tell them to talk about it. Um, but if you don't want to do that, just hold them aside politely for the next few moments. And if you can and address the feedback. Because if you wait like two weeks or three weeks or you're gonna start one, the context of the time from your performance is deeper, you know, or maybe, you know, it's just this I have done you could be the feedback a little sooner, almost immediately, appropriately immediately, um, it works way better. And then if you have a problem where you have a person who's just not paying expectations that they're not continuously documented and had a conversation, then you can proceed down a different path. If you have clearly communicated expectations, but it's just not, you've done all that you can do. I have a blog post on this, and I'll tweet it out later. I have a blog post on some medium where I detail in depth my whole show on course correction. But these are super, super, super crucial um, assets to be a manager because one of your jobs is to communicate and help and steer the team. Any questions on this? Uh, it may not be exactly related to this, but I, one, one of my friends was like in a meeting, right? Like, his suggestion is all the time, surely don't bother. His thing is like, if uh, you're coming on time, then like you're, you're the comment, right? So if you're actually late, it's ba it basically means you're not putting in any effort or like to be being very lazy. Like, Sure, I'm sure you on time. So it's like mm -hmm. either come in on time or early, but if you're late by a couple of minutes, then you're like being late, so you don't even bother. Do you think that's probably like a good idea or not? Um, I so if I, um, it, I mean, it depends. If, um, so I don't think I personally would do that, um, but it depends on the company and how you want to manage. If, um, if that's how you want to manage, that's what the person manager really wants. Let's say you deal with like really big clients and like, you're really sensitive to the late, like you go to the very deep, very, very respectful. Then that would be okay. But then I would also attach to that say, hey, don't come in. Okay. That better be your freaking rare when that happens. If that happens a lot, don't bother coming in at all. You know? And so and so that's where for me it'd be very important to, to state my expectation like, hey. This is why it's important you to come, you know, and, and why I want to be here on time. And if, and and so yeah, I mean, so yes, you can do that, but I think the boss is implicitly saying, hey, you know, don't do this. I would also say, all right, here's the rule. And also, by the way, this is why it's broken this. It's not okay to be here. That's what I would do. Um <clears throat> just to put a different perspective on that. And I'm sure Justin can emphasize this, but if you're in a in a role where you have uh, a lot of meetings, um, and if, depending on your company culture, if you're talking here, you know, several 30 minute back to back meetings. If one person comes in to their first your first meeting five minutes late every single day, it may not seem like a lot of time, but like that five right. minutes pushes it starts pushing back your entire day. And uh, if you know also that that same person, because I've got somebody I'm working with right now, not only do they show up about five to 10 minutes late for every, every time I have a meeting with them, but then we always end up running a little bit long. So it just pushes back everything else I have to do that day. Um, and that can get hugely problematic. It may not seem hugely problematic, problematic for that one person, mm -hmm. but it's gonna throw off. And you've gotta realize that that five minutes, depending on who's present in the room, that five minutes could cost a couple thousand dollars for the company. Absolutely. Well, that's where clearly the clearly the articulation is awesome. I do remember lunch, and it was a 
bite and you can just get the most candid feedback about an order of yours, maybe super easy, even. I can't believe it. It is a pain, but I don't know a bigger one. You know, um, and the thing I always wonder is about if that person orders an ounce, it's really be surprised. And, and if, if we even if it's even our remote chance that they would be, my own philosophy is always saying, okay, I need to stop venting and I need to address this problem for the person. Um, and go to the to hey, you know, and if this person is report to you, I mean, you can talk to them directly, then you can say, look, and just get better on behalf of the future manager. Just because this is having all these impacts on my schedule or my team or our revenue and doing that. So, but that's my one trick on on communicating to your team's expectations. Have you ever been in a situation where you had different expectations for different people, but in the same area? Uh, for instance, if somebody was late, but you knew their circumstance, uh, you know they were consistently late, that your expectation was different for them than it was for someone else. Yeah, I mean, and probably what happened is that, I mean, that, yes, it does happen. Um, and the dynamic that is tricky there is that one person who won't give really, and another person I'm coming down hard on, and that person I'm coming down hard on, what the heck's going on? Like, you need to be able to, at least at some point, from the team, establish some sort of like culture and understanding across the entire team and say, hey, you know, some folks, I mean, we have, we have had examples where my teams typically, Relax, so I can work from home whenever you want. Like, it's not that they really, not that I agree with you, but if you work from home, no big deal. Um, but then when we have someone new joining the team, they say work from home, they don't have systems, they tend to correct them on their own yet, and then they start to use those behaviors, or if the person comes, hey, come in a little later, be later, you know, you know, they might not pick up on their own, but have to sit down and they explicitly say, hey, you know, this is kind of the flexible schedule, the privilege of learning the people back. And, and, and the new way when you're not there yet, so you need to be here on time, and you're, you know, you're by your seat. I don't think you don't play. It's going to be gold. I don't think you don't play. You can basically have a story on your own, and you feel and be corrected on your own. Then you can work the hall more often. You can even come in later, be later. Uh, but I tell you on that point, I need you here. And once again, those sometimes I've had a manager, I'll be best friend and mad about something, but I'm really, really realizing what I'm about. And that helps me you know, get a feel. This is my problem. This is what you're talking about. And they would have that conversation um, in a safe way. I see. The one, one thing, uh, this is just my two cents on that, where I've seen it to where uh, like good good teams or good managers will find a way of like taking these exceptions and say, this is a compromise to help us all work better as a team. But rather than, but then if, if they fail, then it makes it feel like they're, they're playing favorites. So it, it's a it's a really fine line to make sure that that you know it, it's not something you try to sweep under the rug or not address. You address it, but you make it as like this is something because you know it, you know it's something that cannot be avoided you know for whatever reason. So we're doing this that way we can still all work together as a team without anyone being directly impacted. And as long as that message is 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 portrayed, rather than I'm picking favorites or I'm giving someone special privileges over someone else, then I think that that can destroy morale. Oh, absolutely. Um, one, I don't mention it in here, one of the things that we do with our company is Scrum. Um, and everyone seems to forget this part of Scrum, but we have most important like, learning perspectives. And uh, we highlight like, heavily on our perspective to help bring out some of the most team dynamics that people are brushing across their day and whatnot. The other nice thing, too, if you're, if you're going to deliver a course of action and worry about this rank for me, you can help them use the situation. If you have a simple project and say, hey, this is my fault. I have not been in my expectation yet. This is not your fault. And I can kind of diffuse the whole thing and you can say what the expectation is um, and just try to explain it and just say, hey, that way you're not at all. Like, this wire from the bridge, you're not mad about that. You need to not be mad about it, by the way. It's hard to do sometimes. But um, that will allow you to kind of be able to deliver that course direction a lot a little easier. All right. Um, Next one is an aspect of your stakeholders. When you are switching the management, you now not only get to manage the team, but you can manage or be managed by stakeholders. Um, and that 
that can be a, a new, wonderful maybe experience. Um, and once again, manage expectations. And so, you know, like I do with my employees and communicating that expectation, I'll do the inverse with my stakeholders. And we're having problems, say, okay, maybe, well, I'll make sure I understand. Is it your expectation is blank? And we go on and say, oh, well, yes, it's blank. Or maybe they go in and say, Go acapella. Go that. Oh, well, that. Go acapella. Let's figure it out. Anyway, now I can use my real. All right. Uh, so, um, I'll, I'll basically invert that. I'll turn myself into the board and say, hey, is your expectation this? You know, and then maybe we should be able to do that. Because I'm going to believe in like, in an email and confirm that. This is super nice. Can you forget the two expectations? They come back to me like, hey, what's going on? Right? You know, I thought, this might be, I'm really mad about this. And I say, oh, hey, I appreciate your mad. That's awesome. You know, now, we talked about this date, and we talked about this, this expectation. If you want to change it, that's fine. But you need to recognize that you're changing your expression, you're changing the roadmap, you're changing where it is. And we're more than happy to accommodate that. But our timelines have to change. So we're going to have a conversation about it. Uh, you know, and then for me, like my stakeholders, I have my direct report boss, I have his boss, the president of the company, I have a dot line BPA, I kind of send my report to him, I report for his company, I have a project that I work very closely with, to a third party who's on my team, looking to me, and that's my job is to help you know, all those kinds of things. Um, you know, you're also needed to be able to be a shield for your team, you know, or be a going to be. As a manager, it's your job to be disruptive. It's your job to be the one who's bothered. It's your job to be the one who uh, basically does not need to have awesome four hour coding blocks during the day. You know? um, and, and it's your job to, you know, to be the disruptive. In other words, your job is to be one of be the shield, take all the bullets. Whatever it is, and and be that protection for your team, because once again, your job is to allow them to be super coding productive, uh, and you're going out there and having stakeholders, making relationships, and you know helping you know advocate for your team um, the best that you can. Um, you can get tripped in, so your team does it, um, and sometimes we trip. Sometimes you have to catch, you know, those sneaky stakeholders trying to you know go bother your team. You know, and some and you know, like, hey, you know what? I know you want to talk to this developer to work out something. Come to me, and I will be your best avenue to solve your problem. That's what you're supposed to come to me, and we'll figure this out. Um, so that way, your team can be uh, uh, be protected um, and become your stakeholder. Best avenue to solve problems, and then communicate, communicate, communicate. I find my job. I do way, way, way more communication now. I ever did back when I was either clean or you know, developer. Uh, I had spent most of my time just lots and lots of conversation. And 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 you know, and somebody's gotta learn how to uh, to enjoy that, to get satisfaction out of that. Or at least be able to go and do the things that make the team successful. And at the end of the day, when your team goes and what person they launched by it, they launch a new product that looks awesome. And you did nothing that like didn't contribute any code whatsoever. The team killed it. Like that's where you can you can drive some things your satisfaction. Last one, and this might kind of segue what I did before, but also like being defender. So my boss right now is a speed caller. Um, and he's been like by far the best boss I've ever worked for. And the dude like goes to bat for his team. He has our back. One thousand percent of the time, and and you know, he has his, and he will go and he and any way that our team has, any problem that we have, whatever, he has, or whatever, he say, "Hey, see, we have this problem," and he's like, "Done." Kind of even pull up. We'll go and we will take care of the problem. Um, and he's earned, and that really has earned our respect. And then there are times where he's telling us, this, "Guys, we need to make a decision. You guys are not going to like this, but." This is what we have to do as a company. 
this is what has to happen. Because we know he has our backs. But when those tough moments happen, or you know, we have to make edits that we maybe wish we knew what we were doing, like we heard our trust and say, okay, Steve, we'll do this. Uh, and you know, that's one of the best things you can do to be as an actor. The worst thing you can do is destroy your team under the bus. If if someone, this is if, if my, my advice is if your team is doing awesome, pass all the grades down. You say, oh, I had very little stuff to do with it. That was my team job. And you just shower them great. And then if something goes wrong, if something bad, that's 100 percent my fault. And you take it. And and you you know you become a defender for your team. And then you, you don't just let your team go off and do whatever, and you take arrows for them. You know, taking arrows is very uh, you, go and you, you go talk to them and say, hey, I got a bunch of errors in me now. <laughs> I don't, I'm not going to hold it over your head. But we have to figure out how to slice up. You can get shot. <laughs> um, and, like I said, if you're, if you're really taking them to the team, um, you're going to get the end of second year of your people and you're going to get them to help solve these problems. But the last thing you ever want to do is be in a meeting, have something out of you. And even the temptation might be real, it might even be their fault. No, that they were, they, were, they were careless and they pushed above the production, but they should have caught them. They don't need the test. Or they specifically did a commit and push without writing, you know, like they're of course pushing. These are super stupid. You might totally know that that was 1,000 of your fault. And you go, let's go, it's our fault. And I'll, well, our team will figure out what they hear. And do not throw the chamber with the bus. So what will happen is if you get a reputation for that, everyone will know and be like, okay, you know, I have to be in the room, go throw someone else, and you never can watch that person. One of the reasons why I find that so important is uh, it's often difficult to be angry at the person that's standing right in front of you. It's very easy to be angry at the team that's a level removed from you. Uh, and, and similarly, it's, it's often Difficult to see uh, the good things that they do, and uh, I, I think that's for me why what you said uh, rings so true is that uh, as a manager, your job is to bring the people on your team into the room when they're successful, and to close the door and say this is between us when they're not. It's both between us with managing up, and it's between us when you're managing down. I love that one. Not very good. Um, okay, so this is my not so secret weapon. There's a book written by Kim uh, Porter. Porter? I'm not going to name. I've never pronounced her name like without that until this moment. But Camille, she goes by Ska something on Twitter. I call her Twitter. Um, but she's written a book, and basically takes you from being an engineer and goes through like being an engineer, being a lead. Manager, being a director, being a VP, being a CTO, goes the whole progression that like, you can experience being a manager. Um, and it is a fantastic book. I wish I would have found this like six years ago. It wasn't published yet, so I'm not going to do that. It's been out maybe a year, year and a half. If you haven't read this book, this is, this is my memoir recommendation. You can read it today and you can read this. I showed you this first time. Just read this and you're good. Uh, this is a fantastic book. Uh, there's a couple of resources. You have Camille's blog. Um, that I love this stuff. Laura Hogan, she, so Camille is the, was the CTO of Red Uh Laura Hogan, she was the VP of Engineering um, for Etsy. Different, right? And now she works uh, with a different company. I can't remember now. On my head. But she has awesome stuff as well. Michael Luke, he's a VP engineering for Slack. He has, he's known, I think, in brands, I guess. I love his blog, Brands and Repos. I read his stuff all the time. Uh, but here are a couple blogs that I read. The nice thing about engineering is I heard engineering management blog posts. So I've got a blog post on like how best practices used to be seven years ago. It's not very helpful. Uh, but engineering and people management is probably still very, very valid. Um, so I think I think there are kind of things that we've written. Um, they always write awesome, awesome, awesome stuff. So before we get to the last kind of questions area, 
question now is like, okay, well, what do you do? Do you want to go into management? Do you think you have to hire your aspiration? Like what, what can you, you know, uh, like do with as where you're, where you're at? Um, and my first recommendation is read that book. That's by far my number one recommendation. Um, and then number two is, is that if, you know, find opportunities, you know, where you work, help practice some of these skills. You don't need to be a manager to practice my education and stuff. You might be able to force it the same way, so you can use this communication practice. Or use the inverse and go to your boss and say, okay, it seems like your expectation is, like, you have to have those conversations. Um, and then another great thing is find some of the mentors. You don't have to typically wait. They need permission to be a professional. You don't have to have a formal process that I need to do. Um, and just you know, start practicing that mentorship and then work with some one on those, those little, you know, those exercises are really going to be a practice. will we'll give you a good chance to say, okay, now we're going to give you like two or three people. Well, okay, now it's going to be like six or eight people. Okay, let's see, you know, now you can manage two or three or four or four. Oh, well, now you can do VP or CTO, which is super amazing. They're all the top options. Go to Congratulations. <laughs> um, and so, uh, so you have to read the stuff and, and, and just start paying attention to those skills that you need to be aware of. Just try to find opportunities to use them. And then lastly, you can always go to your boss. You trust your boss and your good person to say, hey, you know, this is a career path I have and I desire to go now. Um, in my career, you know, I'm no more functioning or anything. I should deserve one. But he was, hey, look, I want other assignments or ways of stretching and practice some of these techniques. Now prepare me down the road for when. Uh, when you might have the need to have them as a manager and, and put in that work to get a piece of that experience. So, and uh, yeah, I think you can. For me, you know, I find doing that very rewarding. Um, and uh, I think uh, for me, so I recently switched teams to move to the department team company. Um, and I was overseeing two teams, and we moved from all over to different areas. I had one team in particular, the Desert News, that's why I started to work with them. And um, my last day with them, the, one of the, their senior leadership told me, said, hey, we have this new um, uh, website that needs to be built, and we have a hard deadline, and we need to done in two and a half months. I was like, okay, and I thought it was just over, whatever, and we talked through it, and said, you know what? Uh, as long as you know these impediments don't come up and that's the most of the issue of business, seems ready. They won't get flat. We'll do this. And I, that was my last day, and I changed departments. I started working with some, and I watched the team I don't mention and teach go out and use the new app that was part of their deadline, and everyone was super happy. I'm just like, ah, yes. And that was super, super rewarding for me. And so there is no Morning experiences that we had in the management, uh, but we gotta love people. We gotta love to be able to understand that you want know, this is not a good repository for each app, but that you're going to your teams and characteristics to push and say, hey, I like each one better now. So, um, you know, unfortunately, you know, the tools that you have to be different, but um, helping and develop and helping grow people is extremely rewarding. Okay, any questions? What do you think is your biggest obstacle of moving in management? Uh, right now, it's probably higher than hell. <laughs> um, I think everyone faces that. Uh, that's number one. And that's partly why we're looking to try to go to higher, more community level people in the training classes and find ways to reach them. Have people not so, like me. So, you guys have some territories, but, you know, we try. I'm. <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs> yes. Uh, we may need to drag this question over to JCWs, but I'll at least kick it off here. Early on in your slides, you have a description of a senior engineer becoming a senior manager. We all have kind of a picture in our head of what it means to climb to. Um, corporate ladder, and invariably it goes to management. 
I've met a lot of people in my career who don't have that management in them, but they love being coders. What have you done, or what are your thoughts on developing the career ladder beyond the senior engineer? Yeah. Do you want to? Do you want to still hear? Yeah, for me. Okay, go ahead. Read the book. Oh uh, well, the <laughs> read the book. <laughs> so, as I come out of my email, there's a plus senior engineer ladder. They have two tracks. And so, if you have two basic open engineer, engineer one, two, three, it's all kind of one track, and they split. If you want to take the A T E and the manager, the other other track is to stay an individual contributor and to say, you know what, I have people and and for us. So for us, uh, uh, we had an engineer who uh, had no business people as a director. Uh, he was super talented, super bright, had the best intentions in the world. No business being manager at all. And it caused like two, three, four years of grief uh, matters. And, and then he kind of, no, and, and, and to be honest, it wasn't fair to him, it wasn't fair to his employees, it wasn't fair to any of the Really crappy situation all around. And the reason why you want to put that path is you want to have the pay increases and you want to have the input and motivation. And so for us, that's why we want to be able to have that, uh, that second track. There's a lot of work going on in the industry of being able to go and provide, hey, now that you're, you know, you're a senior trade, you become a senior engineer, or you can become a you know, staff engineer or principal engineer, and be able to provide that growth. And I learned there's still some people like skills needed for that, but but it's different. You know, it's, and and, and the technique is different. You pull it out like, hey, you seem to be a good communicator working with other people, but you actually send boxes and help inspire people. But it's skills are very different than being a manager of a little market. Um, so that's my Philosophies that engineering organizations need to adopt those two tracks. Um, and and uh, some of us are doing that, some aren't. Um, but I think, you know, uh, what we call the Peter Principle, you know, the promoted to one loop, the one loop up to your level of confidence, the confident, 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 level, confident, confident, you get stuck there. They want to be great with people that are still that are confident and want to put forth different ways that keeps those same skills. So that's something I would advocate for. Um, and they published theirs, and we're at BDM, we're in the middle of the process, these are finalizers, we're in the middle of the process of early mark, early mark. So there are a couple of engineers who want career progression, and, and I want them to have a conversation and say, look, here are the different areas that, and I'll just show you, um, that you need to grow in. So, can you turn your mic on? Yes, I'll turn it back on now. Uh, not the whole core secrets. Okay. Um, one of the things I really like about this when you pull it up is that you can't progress in either path. You can spend some time with development in the path and try to figure out the team lead, which is not considered a promotion, but a skill set that you have to, to have. Uh, the rotation. But something that you have to have before you can progress. Uh, either way, and they use PAD attributes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here we go. We have this dexterity strength works in the first one. Uh, yeah, in your one, your two, your three. And, and I like how they broke this out because once again, I had engineers who were super strong in the skills. The communication, and then in your two, you need some basic communication skills. Well, basically, getting stuff done in this book should be your production skill. Um, and so, uh, and so, if you're engineer one, if you're two, you're a senior engineer, and then you can, and then you can go and progress down to the tech lead, which splits up that track, or you can stay, you can senior engineer two, senior staff engineer, principal uh, engineer, Chief architects to other things. And they have a manager track, they're tech lead, engineering lead, engineering director, chief engineering, and then director. And 
and you'll clearly identify an engineering director, like what kind of impact do you need to have in your organization? What kind of director do you need to have? What kind of charisma, what kind of communication leadership do you need to have? Um, and now we have someone who is, who is let's say they're a tech lead and we want to do an engineering lead on oh, and go through and think, oh, you have all these things, you have a framework or a conversation. Is that being like uh, subjective, like, well, you're not ready for it. You know, I'd be right, but this way that I can go on there and help describe where I need to grow. And if you decide, no, I don't want to grow on that path, awesome. I have a different path that we can go down. You still need to communicate with people, but it's, but it's different than communication. Um, and, you know, you don't might not have to deal with like stakeholders um, in the same way. Um, so that's what we're doing. In a year or two after we implemented it, try it, they'll come back and say, hey, here's how it was for us. One thing that she did mention is that at Denver Marmalade, they, their first out of this was a total failure because they just copied the middle organization's intent matter and brought it over. But there were differences in organizations that the descriptions didn't make sense and it wasn't helpful. So we're doing the same thing. We're going there to using this as a template and idea generation, but we're writing the template around. Where we can go in and then say, okay, at DDM, what does it mean to be a software engineer three? What are the skill sets that you need? What type of skill? How does your conversation should be like? What's the impact you should have on the organization? And how is your communication supposed to be? And if you want to become a teammate or a director, like here are the skill sets that you must have to be able to do it. If you want to go that path, awesome. Let's work on that. And I like to have someone come to me and say, oh, Surprising here. I didn't think we want. In fact, I know for a fact I had uh, one of our one of my team leads. Uh, everyone assumed he just wanted to be an engineer. He comes to be a developer his whole life. That's what I wanted to do. Until I had an asked him, he said, Oh, I want to become a team leader and director one day. I was like, Oh, all right, well, let's help train you with that. Now, so you might have someone come to you and he surprises you. And you have a framework that you can help grow them and, and prepare them for the goal that they can be successful in. Because it sucks, it sucks, it sucks to have some move into a role they're not ready for and have them fail. It's not great for them, it's not great for the company, it's not great for you. It's just that's a lose, lose, lose all around. So now that I've seen this version of the career ladder, I have a different question. Um, there's a lot of companies that uh, are getting away from having like the engineer levels, the one, the two, the three, because uh, I think there's a lot of people that have a lot of negative experiences with compartmentalizing that way, at least at those levels where uh, you end up with people saying, I'm a senior engineer, or I'm an engineer three, and this is you know what we what I'm expected to do, or so I don't know. It creates weird office politics, some people mm -hmm. think. Um, so how do you avoid the, the weird team dynamics where I, I, I can understand how where it's useful potentially, but at the same time, I think you run the risk of when you start assigning titles like that, then people start getting a big head or, or how do you avoid those politics where it creates weird dynamics in your teams? Yeah. So um, we try to use add-ons from a principle, not all of all the but it should be a self automation and so for us, it's engineer one, two, or three is less about authority and more about um, being frank, being about conversation. And, and, and that way, if someone comes and says, hey, I think I deserve an uh, increased conversation, then okay, well, you'll be able to be sure that you can you know, deliver additional value to the company and you're doing the, you know, that conversation goes up, the expectations go up as well. And so that's where, uh, kind of for us, there's, there's, a very, there's almost no authority for us when it comes to engineering one, two, or three. Do you keep those levels like, are they, do they keep them confidential or, or secret? Or, or are they putting those on their email signatures of, you know, I'm a uh, software engineer three? I'll leave it on my email signature. I'm on LinkedIn. Okay. Um, but it's, it's more about, yeah. And, and for us, you know, one thing is, when you hire someone, our expectation is that over the next five years, we'll grow, so you hire you one. Our expectation is the next five or six years, you're going to become free. And so it's, it's also 
you know, we all have people who claim they suck at music. They should be stuck at one or two and just say it's getting a career one time. And and it's like we have a limited number of seats. We only, we only have 23 years ago. So it's more of a, that part of the career ladder is more about just helping people grow and then frankly grow their compensation mm -hmm. as we go the organization. Um, so and then where where Florida can't take the twenty place is more kind of a director level where there's some companies that want to say you have a team or multiple teams and, and even then I hate the third word word because in for our view it should be less about the director's job is not about you know controlling what your people do, but it's about empowering you to do the right things you can uh, and be successful as a support structure, not like a authority structure. Uh, it's always happened. But well, is the influence a better word? Yes. You used that word earlier, John, and it, I will say that one of the most important conversations I think I've had in my career was the day my boss sat me down and said, Noah, you're really bad at dealing with stakeholders. We th I think we should talk about an architecture role for you. Uh, and uh, it, it certainly put me on to that second career path. But yeah. You can still grow influence in an architectural role. And again, yeah, influence the clouds earlier. You have, you know, you have our scrum masters, they have no authority, and they rely solely on their influence in the cloud to go do their job. And so engineering has a similar case. Um, if you have somebody come to you and, you know, and you have where you have these two tracks, and they say, I'm not sure which one I want to do. Like, what do you, how do you help them with that? Uh, so, what I would do is, I, you know, first off, is, you know, I think um, in, in, the, in the manager's path, of talks about, about the concept of an employee. And that, that's a role that can shift around itself. So, in the HR position, it's kind of a role split in the team. And give someone an opportunity to kind of, you know, be a technical lead for a project. Couple months or whatever, if you leave this team, that, 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 you know, that responsibility to you. Um, but, but, you know, giving people little opportunities to do stuff. So, for example, Spencer, Spencer he thought he would have more managers to have, but he talked about it and gave him things to kind of do work on. He, like, really enjoyed it. It wasn't like he contacted him as a manager. <laughs> I choose to live out of it. And he gave him opportunities to have a junior developer who was. Uh, who had you know, this kind of look and grow report to him. He got to kind of work with him and help figure things out. And uh, that was a new growing experience to him. And, and so a lot of times we'll, we'll find opportunities to have a junior person report to a more senior person. And we only have one report, but for them to kind of flex their muscles and kind of get used to that dynamic. And maybe you have to get a role player like Carl. Exposing people to low risk, high learning opportunities that gives them exposure looks like is a great way to help them figure out you know, what we want to go. And for us, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. We've got someone standing through the computer track for a while, telling you they're old in their careers, and they say, Oh, you know, now we're going to do it. You know, it's not like you have to make this one choice. You know, I swallow the red pill, the blue pill, and after that, that's, like, that's your one moment to make that choice. How do you gauge? Uh, so you mentioned shifting around technical lead roles, uh, and I know my in my last job that's kind of how our CTO ran things, but it was often unclear whether you were successful or not in a project you were technical lead for. How do you guys uh, handle tr uh, measuring and tracking progress and then? Communicating success or failure at the end of uh, a test period. Um, <laughs> so, so, this would be kind of two ways that we measure. The first way is going to be through our script process, strong process. So, script reviews. People hitting the goals, teams collectively hitting the goals, and then uptime, you know, like is stuff stable or features done correctly. 
there's that kind of asset that can be done there as well. And then there's also going to be go to the version of the work to do, there's one where we had conversations about uh, how we're doing. One of the things that I like to do is when I have an engineer, there's a say the engineer two, you know, from engineer zero, the engineer three, one from the team lead, um, is to go in and talk to them about what we want to do. And then I'll tell them, hey, look, I'm not going to have a conversation with five or six conversations with your coworkers, your stakeholders, your product owners, you know, all these different people. And they are going to be the elements of, hey, what do you love about Bob? What, what's awesome about Bob? What, what, you know, really work with them. And I'll give a scenario. Let's say I never use a hit, hit by the bus terminology, but I have two employees hit by vehicles. <laughs> so I use the lottery, the lottery, 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 lottery. Yep, the inherited billion dollars in the next year. I'd be happy about that. Happened. You know, let's say the inherited billion dollars, like, hey, I won Bob Allen, I'll see you guys later. Um, and the stakeholder is like, okay, let's say so and so got inherited billion dollars, they leave the company, and this person now becomes your senior engineer or becomes your team leader. What concern do you have? And I have an answer kind of a good way of priming thinking like, ooh, like, right? and we can kind of describe what the concerns would be. I compile that information and then I'll sit down with that person and say, hey, the next six months, everything you're going to have to work on. And you'll have to work on a month, month that will be an academic six months, or whatever I'm learning from. But then I'll give you something to ask me to do, work towards getting your promotion. And then when you get the promotion, you're like, hey, look, how much awesome of an employee you are. And so something that I like to there's no longer going to be team lead, there'll be preparation or attempt to lead, there'll be preparation going to that, and then when you have the job, you can kind of, the, the, their their control kind of responsibilities are really above mentorship within the checking. Hey, how's it going? What problems are you running into? Let's talk this through, you know, and give them the support. Because if you give them a promotion, you want them to succeed. You don't want them to become a leader. You want them to be an awesome boss. All right, and my voice is done. So, thank you, everyone. I'll share them. All right, this is recorded too. Thank you, Justin. Excellent presentation. Uh, so we have a couple of items of business. First, we're waiting for speakers.